Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. And on behalf of the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences, it is my honor to welcome you all here for one of the most exciting days uh, of the year for us in the college. And we have the 2021 DW Brooks uh, lecture happening here this afternoon. And we thank you for joining us from all over uh, for this afternoon and for what we have uh, planned for you. And we would like to extend a special welcome to Mrs. Nancy Brooks, the daughter of the late D.W. Brooks and her family for joining us here today. So welcome, very glad to have you with us. So today we will enjoy what promises uh, to be a very thought provoking lecture. And we will continue to carry on the legacy of D.W. Brooks, a man who really laid the foundation uh, for the work that we do today all across our college. So D.W. Brooks uh, has the distinction of being both the youngest and the oldest member of our college. He began teaching in this college at the age of 19 and returned after a very long career in agriculture uh, to serve as a visiting professor right up until his death at the age of 97. So that's a very long time of service there for D.W. Brooks. Uh, he truly dedicated his entire life to this college and improving agriculture. And for those who may not be familiar with Brooks's impact, well, we have a video of, it, of his life about D.W. Brooks that may encourage you, that I would encourage you to view on our website, which is located at dwbrooks.ciaes.uga.edu. And I'd encourage you to take a look at that. But at this time, we'd like to take a brief moment to introduce you to the 2021 winners of our D.W. Brooks Faculty Awards of Excellence. And this is a college's top honor for faculty. And um, I want to mention those award winners uh, that we have here for this year. The Award for Excellence in Teaching uh, goes to uh, Dr. Maren Brewer, and uh, she's an Associate Professor of Mycology in the Department of Plant Pathology. Uh, we also have the Award for Excellence in Research, and that goes to Dr. Zengle Liu, and he's a Georgia Seed Development Professor in Soybean Breeding and Genetics in the Department of Crop and Soil Sciences and in the Institute of Plant Breeding, Genetics, and Genomics. We also have the Award for Excellence in Extension, and that goes to Dr. Scott Momford, and he is the UGA Cooperative Extension Peanut Agronomist and a peanut uh, team leader um, at the UGA Tifton campus. We also have the Award for Excellence in Public Service Extension, and that goes to Jacob Price. And he is a UGA Extension County Coordinator and Agriculture and Natural Resources Agent in Lowndes County. And we also have the Award for Excellence in Diversity, and that goes to Shabanor Smith, Dr. Shabanor Smith, and uh, she is an associate professor and graduate coordinator in the Department of uh, Plant Pathology here in the college. And I want to extend my greatest appreciation and congratulate all these award winners. Um, we really do appreciate all of your work, your leadership, as well as your accomplishments on behalf of the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences. And congratulations and thank you for all that you do. And any of you can learn more about the winners on our college website, as well as so, through social media channels um, over the course of this week as uh, we are uh, pushing out these announcements about these D.W. Brooks Award winners. So now, at this time, it is my true honor to introduce to you our, our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Ismahe Alafi and who is joining us from Rome, where it happens to be 8.30 in the evening out there. So we really appreciate you uh, being here and joining us. We had wished that you'd be here, here in person, uh, but we really are appreciative of the Zoom technology so we can have you here with us. Dr. Luffy is a geneticist by training and has nearly two decades of experience in agriculture research and development in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. And she is internationally known for her work promoting neglected and underutilized crops using non-fresh water in agriculture and empowering women in science. Until recently, Dr. Luffy 
had led the International Center for Biosaline Agriculture based in Dubai. And previously, she held senior scientific and leadership positions in the Canadian government. She has also worked as a scientist with several international research organizations. Ismail has a passion for agriculture science, its management, and its integration with policy, and she is currently serving as the first ever chief scientist of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. This new position was created within FAO's core leadership structure in the fall of 2020 to place science, innovation, and technology at the center of a strategic framework. I really do imagine that this has been quite a busy year to join the FAO in this capacity, given the COVID-19 pandemic and during a time when FAO is honing its vision on adjusting its strategy to achieve zero hunger by the year 2030. So we are very thrilled to have Dr. Luffy has accepted our invitation to deliver our D.W. Brooks lecture this year. And she's uniquely well positioned and qualified to share with our audience this urgency of using science and technology to generate our global progress towards achieving UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, so we will have a Q&A at the end of her lecture, and we encourage you to submit your questions by clicking on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen during the course of the talk, but we'll address the questions um, at the end of her lecture. Now let's all welcome our distinguished speaker and guest, Dr. Ismail Alevi. Ismail, glad to have you with us. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nick Place. It's really a pleasure to, to connect via internet with the colleagues in uh, UGA. I wish I was there in person. Uh, so uh, I will try to make it as lively as if I was in person there. <laughs> give it a try. So it's really my pleasure to be with you today and to try to give you a bit of uh, what I think about how science, technology, and innovation and accelerate the transformation of agri our agri-food system. I think really this year, it's the year of transformation. So not only because we had the UN, UN Food System Summit, but because really we all came to an understanding that our agri-food system needs to do better and needs to be more optimal. So with that, let me start my presentation. So first, I wanna just remind all of us that well before COVID-19, we were already off track to achieve the SDGs and to meet the Global Development Agenda 2030. Now, the pandemic has made this significantly more challenging. So before COVID, we are talking a lot about COVID. It's a huge issue, but even before we were off track. And what's happening is that there is a number of challenges that are really hampering us from getting to the 2030. Some of the main challenges is the economic slowdown and downturn, the climate variability and the climate crisis, conflict, we're seeing more and more conflict, and the, if the, the fact that most of the nutritious food, it's way too expensive and it's out of the reach of about 2 billion people worldwide. So some of the drivers are external to the food system, for example, the conflict, the climate variability, the economic slowdown, and some of them are really intrinsic to the, to the climate, to the food system. What's happening, what's happening, the internal one will be, for example, the productivity, the inefficiency, the waste and, and food loss. But what's happening really is that we are seeing that many of these drivers are coming, coming together. So there are, there, we are seeing a lot of combination of these drivers happening, and we are seeing them happening more intensely. So if we look at the latest SOFA, uh, which is a publication that really tracks how many undernourishment we have and how high is the prevalence of undernourishment worldwide, we see that in 2020, we are talking about 720 to 811 million people that goes to bed hungry every night. And if we look at the, the difference between 2019 and 2020, we have about 161 million more people in 2019. So this is really a huge number that struck us all. 
And what I want to also point here is that normally we give a number. This year we are giving a range, the range of 720 to 811 to reflect to really the difficulty we had to gather data and the difficulty also we had to, to analyze certain data that we got from certain countries. So when you look at that, you had 161 million more in one single year, it's a really ring a bell. We are already off track. We are try, trying to end hunger by 2030. And in one single year, we are getting 161 million more that are going to, to, be, to, to hunger under the, the, the hungry and the poverty line. So definitely when we look more in details, the sharpest increase happened in Africa, followed by Latin America, and then the Caribbean. Most importantly, all subregion in Africa and in Latin America and the Caribbean, and most subregion of Asia also showed an increase on the pandemic here. So this time, it's not so much Asia, it's very much Africa and Latin America and the Caribbean. So compared with 2019, about 46 million more people in Africa, 57 million more in Asia, and about 14 million more in Latin America and the Caribbean were affected by hunger in 2020. Overall, more than half of the world and the Rhenish are found in Asia. So if we look at the numbers in total, not so much where the increase happened, we can see that still we have the majority of undernourishment in Asia with 418 million, and then one third in Africa with 282 million. So that's really what it shows. And what it shows as well is that most of the countries that got the most impacted are the countries that are affected by a combination of those drivers. So not only conflict, not only economic drive, drive, the slowdown, not only economic, but a combination of, of those drivers. So one of the reasons why we are where we are, it's really that our climate is changing and we are COP26 just started. And just before COP26, we had uh, a wonderful report that came out of work group two that really gave us crude numbers. So one of the biggest elephant in the room, one of the biggest issue that we have to talk to uh, that in some ways have affected the COVID-19 crisis, it's climate change. So the working group one uh, report uh, on climate change that just came out a few months ago, uh, really looked at what are the possible future what are the possible future that we can see? And there we could, we, we heard that the global surface temperature will continue to increase until at least 2050, and then all emission scenarios. So even under the lowest emission scenario that we are calling it 1.5 degree, we will have an increase of temperature. Many changes in the climate system includes increasing the frequency and intensity of hot extreme, marine heat waves and heavy precipitation, agricultural ecological drought in some region, and proportion of intense tropical cyclone, as well as reduction in the Arctic sea ice, snow cover, as well as permafrost. So in all scenarios, and really what was very strong in this report is that it gave us a, a bit of, a, of an analysis at a regional level, at the country level, and even at the county level. The other things that was very special in this report, I would say, is that the report also gave us some numbers that are really quite striking. Uh, for example, that the carbon dioxide in, in the atmosphere is the highest in about 2 million years, that we are seeing a sea rise much more than since the last ice age, for example. So this numbers really that showcase how human have impacted the climate and how the impact of human, it's at, at, at the maximum of it, really was uh, uh, an opening, an, uh, an eye opening and the data was very strong. So on the agri-food system, what are the implications? On crop production, the implications are all across all sectors from crop production, to livestock, to fisheries, to other way of, of producing food and using food. On the crop production, there will be impact on crop productivity through model climate change, like there might be shifts in cropping varieties planted. 
there will be seasonal changes like warming trends that might extend the growing season. We will have extreme events like high temperature that will affect critical growth periods, flooding, droughts, you name it. On the livestock side, uh, livestock system are increasingly impacted by climate change. And that really will include increasing, in, in increasing temperature, precipitation variation, uh, that will affect very much really also the livestock productivity, the livestock uh, production per se, but also the livestock diseases, the livestock reproduction and the animal health. So the effect will be really very high, uh, not only on the animal per se, but also the feed that is part and parcel of the animal cycle. On the fisheries and aquaculture, there is projected impact on fisheries and aquaculture that are very negative at the global scale, severely so in many regions. And again, the report shows that there are major impact that could include displacement of stocks and aquaculture, mortality of shellfish from the acidic water, as well as reduction in the catch of feed fish uh, and increasing severity of tropical storms and flooding. And as well, the climate change will also affect food safety, but also high risk livelihoods. The other component that are very important when we talk about food security and we talk about transformation of our agri-food agri system to really fulfill the global development agenda and the SDGs, it's really biodiversity loss. So as for the climate, where we had a body of scientific information, scientific evidence, since for the IPCC, it's since 1988, but I think the strongest report starts being produced in 2018 and coming, same thing for biodiversity. We have really very strong scientific evidence of what's happening in terms of biodiversity loss. Uh, and this really, uh, knowing that's just between brackets, what I wanna really say is that we know we are losing a lot. We know we are talking about 1 million species at extinction, but also our know-how of biodiversity is very limited. We are not, we keep really uh, modeling and, and predicting the number of species on, on planet Earth and the latest number it says we have 8.7 million species on planet Earth, but the reality of things, we don't know them all particularly when we talk about oceans, but particularly also when we talk about microorganisms and underground uh, microorganisms. And, and, and maybe just for a minute to talk more about microorganisms in the soil, they are very much, they are very much part of the agri-food systems. So species above ground are very much connected with species underground. And when we talk about producing more with less input, we need really to pay attention to the diversification and the biodiversity that exists in microorganisms, be, be it mycorrhizas, be it endophyte or other microorganisms, because we see a lot of synergies in the soil. And we see now we have more and more information about the connectedness between micronutrient in the soil and, and or micronutrient deficiency in the soil versus deficiencies in human health. The other area that really we have to, to, to pay attention to, and that it's affecting a lot when we talk about food security and nutrition security, and again, transformation of our agri-food system, it's the burden of food loss and illnesses. WHO estimate that every year we have about 600 million people, which is one in 10 people fall ill due to eating and safe food. Children under five account for about a third of those cases, but also account for a third of the 420,000 deaths that we get annually because of foodborne illnesses. So unsafe food causes more than 200 different acute and chronic diseases with the burden of unsafe food disproportionately affecting a vulnerable and marginalized people, very much linked to uh, accessibility to, to, uh, to safe water, very much uh, 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 connected with the poverty level. Uh, our soil are no longer safe. There is physical, chemical hazard, such as toxin, pesticide, vet drugs, energy use, biological hazard, 
including bacteria, viruses, and parasites that are the cause of many diseases. So uh, this is an area that really, uh, it would be very important to develop it because um, as we started really a really a big movement towards human health by reducing diseases, we need to do the same in terms of foodborne illnesses, but also diseases at the field that uh, are causing about 17% of losses at, at, the, at the field level. So what do we need to do? There is no doubt that we need to transform our agri-food system with greater resilience to the major drivers addressing inequalities while ensuring healthy, healthy diets that is affordable, sustainable, and inclusive. Even after the COVID-19 pandemic is gone, there are dark clouds on the horizon that will continue to challenge our efforts to end hunger and malnutrition. And that's where it's very important for us to talk about building back better or building forward better, but it's also very important for us to recognize that COVID-19 is an issue that might go hopefully in a few months or a year, but really the issues that are still remaining for our, with us are food insecurities, conflict, climate extreme, economic swings that are a reality and will not disappear, but will continue to occur and inclusively occur in combination, as I said earlier. So I want to maybe spend a few minutes on the inequalities and the importance of really looking at the social inequalities. Uh, the persistence and the high level of inequalities in all its dimension and the unaffordability of healthy diet are really structural issues that will not be resolved without action. And that's where I'm gonna talk later about uh, FAO new strategic framework that to really target SDG two and one, which we know very well, which is the zero hunger and no poverty, but also SDG 10, which is reducing inequalities, because that's one of the basic uh, underlying issues that is creating a lot of um, a lot of, of the issue we are seeing right, right now, including conflicts, including affordability of the healthy diet and, and many other big challenges. So if we talk about really we need that to transform our agri-food system, uh, we can do it without science. We can do it without new data. We can do it without innovation. So I think to do so, if we wanna really get the transform transformation right, we need to use data and particularly big data that now we have the computing power to, to analyze uh, and to collect. We need to use science and we need to use innovation. And, and that has to be across different components of the agri-food system. We need to scale climate resilient in our agri-food system. We need to integrate the human and the development uh, uh, nexuses uh, because as we have more conflict, those conflicts require development to fade away and not be replaced by other conflict. We need again data, science and innovation to strengthen our economic resilience of the most vulnerable. We need to address, as I said earlier, the structural inequalities, ensuring that intervention are pro poor and inclusive. And when we talk about solution, we have to make sure that those solutions are really for the small, small scale uh, farmers that are really producing about 80% 80, 80 of the global food. And of course, we have to pursue food system with no negative impacts and health of the environment. So that the one health approach is very important. And we have really to produce more with less or produce more without making more damage and by restoring ecosystem. And when we talk about really agri-food system, it's, it's really talking about the whole system at a, at a system level, not only the value chain, but beyond the value chain. So that's our intervention really make changes um, uh, in, in terms of uh, international development at large. So within that, the UN Food System Summit was called by the Secretary General Antonio Guterres. Uh, and the idea was really that we have to stop thinking on a portion of the value chain or even just the value chain. The idea is that 
within the decade of action, we have about nine seasons only to get to 2030. And we have those huge ambition, ambition targets that we signed up for all countries in 2015. But really, how could we do it? How could we accelerate the changes? How could we catch up with time, particularly with looking at that the numbers of hungry people is going up, not going down since 2018, even before COVID-19. So COVID-19 gave us the biggest hip, but even before COVID-19, we saw that there was an increase in terms of malnutrition and hunger. And that's where the, the really the UN Food System Summit came to tell us that if we wanna solve it, we have to look a bit higher. We have to have the bigger picture and we have to, to bring in not only ministers of agriculture or ministers of water, but also bring in ministers of health, ministers of infrastructure, ministers of finance. So because it's beyond really just, just the, the, the production cycle per se, or even the processing and the value chain. And I think that was a golden opportunity for us to really bring together all these actors along the agri-food system. Uh, just a number really that is striking and many people, I'm still looking for the reference for it, is that we have about 4.5 billion people that are employed or their livelihood is connected to the agri-food system. So a huge portion of the people are part of the agri-food system if it's, if it's providing uh, livelihood and employability for 4.5 billion people. So uh, within that, uh, that uh, spectrum of the UN Food System Summit, uh, I had the pleasure to be part of the scientific committee of the summit. And we organized science days on the 8th and 9th of July. Uh, and it was preceded by three days before that, where we had about 40 different side events representing about 80 different countries. And the idea behind it, it's really recognizing the pivotal role of science, technology, and innovation for food system transformation. It was organized by the scientific committee and it was hosted by FAO. And the objective was really to assess the challenges that are confronting the food system and share with the participant the robust science-based evidence and options to achieve more healthy diets and more efficient more inclusive and more resilient and sustainable food system, to explore the frontier of science and opportunities and controversies as well that we have around new technologies and around science, um, and to critically as well assess, and to critically assess the risk and opportunities and controversies in science, sorry, and to explore the frontier of science, really to give hope that there is new technologies there is new ways that might allow us to do better and to be more efficient and to be more, uh, more resilient to agri-food system. And the fourth uh, component, it's really to strengthen the science policy interface so that the existing scientific evidence can effectively inform policy and that policy in turn can better use science to support the transition to sustainable, inclusive and resilient food system. So with that uh, science days and the work of the scientific committee, we had uh, a strategic report that, uh, that is on the website. I will send you right now the, the, the link uh, from the scientific committee of the UN Food System Summit. And we actually draw on a comprehensive food system framework action. And we provided seven main driven innovation that really were elaborated in the paper and that we think are very important if we are really to design an agri-food system that is better for people, better for the planet and better for prosperity. So the first one, it's innovation to end hunger and increase availability and affordability for healthy diet and nutritious food. And here I might give an example, like there is a paper that is, that is, uh, uh, promoting the need that we need to shift from certain staple crop to more nutritious crops, whereby by shifting about 50 million hectares from wheat and maize and rice to fruit and vegetables, we could really make a huge impact in terms of nutrition. The second innovation is to de-risk food system and strengthen resilience, in particular for negative emission farming growing on advanced science and traditional knowledge. 
And here on this one, there is a number of coalitions that really came out of the UN Food System Summit. And one of them is AIM, which is Agriculture Innovation for uh, Climate Mission that is led by the US and UAE and other countries. The third, it's innovation to overcome inefficient and unfair land, credit, labor, and natural resource uh, use arrangement and facilitate the inclusion and the empowerment and the rights of women, the youth, and also uh, tackle a little bit the indigenous people. The fourth one, it's bioscience and digital innovation for improving people's health, enhancing system productivity, and the restoring ecological well-being. The fifth one, it's innovation to keep and where needed, regenerate productive soils, water and landscape, and particularly to protect the agricultural genetic base and the biodiversity. The sixth innovation is around innovation for sustainable fisheries and aquaculture and the protection of coastal areas and oceans. And if you go to the website, most of those innovation, there is a number of, of coalition that were, that were developed by different countries, different groups to really feed into these innovations. So, for example, for the sixth one, there is the Blue Food Initiative, uh, 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 they call it coalition, the Blue Food Coalition that is really embedding how could we do it better? How could we increase our intake in terms maybe of protein, but also in terms of micronutrients, in, in, in terms of amino acid and what have you from the Blue Food. And the seventh, the seventh one is engineering and digital innovation for efficiency and inclusiveness of food system and empowerment of youth and the rural communities through engineering, through digital innovation. One of the really very important papers that were also discussed and, and developed within the scientific committee as part of the UN Food System Summit and to support the transformation is really a modeling looking at the synergies and trades off between actions in the food system. And here really what, what the study was to look mostly at SDG2. So what is the trade off? What are the synergies between SDG2 and the other SDGs? And what we could find is that really um, the, the SDG2, it's very much linked, not always positively, but sometimes negatively to many SDGs. In particular to SDG1, which is really central for food security and can unlock many additional benefits across the SDGs. So SDG2 is closely integrated as well with SDG3, which is the good health and the well-being to the close link between malnutrition, maternal health and child health, as well as deaths associated with poor diet. Uh, other socioeconomic SDG, SDGs include connection between SDG2 and SDG4, which is education, SDG5, gender equality, SDG8, decent work and economic growth, and also SDG10, reduced inequalities. And, and basically, what it shows uh, that many of the SDGs are key enablers for SDG2. So if we want to get to zero hunger by 2030, we need also to work on many SDGs, and we have also to recognize many of the traits of, and we need to address it. And that's really very important. For example, in terms of producing more, uh, are we harming biodiversity? Is there a way to produce more in certain ecosystems, but keep other ecosystems for, uh, for um, environmental services, for example? Uh, so there is a lot of trades off that needs really to be well studied, well analyzed. And countries, as they are developing their national programs, and as are they are reporting on their SDGs target, needs to recognize those traits off and take the right decision. So in the paper as well, what we uh, emphasize is that uh, the modes of implementation need to specially focus when we talk about implementing all those seven innovation, for example, and implementing the transformation of the agri-food system, we have to really focus on the finance, on the capacity and on the governance. The report calls on governments, especially least and middle income countries to review the level of their investment in food system science and allocate at least 1% of their food system related GDPs to food system science and innovation with the perspectives 
to substantially exceed this target. So finance, not only finance from developing countries, but all of finance from developing the countries has to be increased to get the new solution that we require. Investment in capacity for science and innovation need as well to expand with more attention to strengthening the local research capacity, developing more inclusive, more transparent and more equitable science partnership, promoting international research cooperation and addressing intellectual properties right issues where they hinder innovation that can serve food and nutrition, uh, security, food safety, and sustainability, sustainability goals. And the third component in the implementation, it's really the governance. Food system science and food system policies need stronger framework for a constructive and evidence-based integration for moving ahead. So the science policy interface, the science policy society interface, the the, the fact that as scientists, we need to start from a policy question, but then when we have an answer, the policies have to change accordingly, and we need to keep that, that circle coming around. So, so what are some of the key outcomes of the UN food system? So we have to recognize that this is the first ever UN food system summit. Um, that's ever happened in September in New York on the 23rd and 24th of September. It was really a summit that was a capstone moment for about 18 months of uh, process that was designed to empower all people to leverage the power of food system to drive our recovery from COVID-19 pandemic and get us back on track to achieve all the SDGs by 2030. It offered, I think, a catalytic moment for public mobilization and actionable commitment by head of state and government and other constitu constituencies, leaders, um, including civil society, including private sector. The summit led the basis for accelerated action on food system to achieve the SDGs and the momentum built through the journey to date would need to be maintained. Sincerely, I think we never talked about food security as much as this year. Uh, and one of the reasons it's really COVID-19 and that people understood that what they are eating, it's, it's actually the solution. It's not so much uh, medication. Medication could be through food if you have a strong immune system. So the connection between human health and nutrition was very, very big on the agenda. And the fact that this year we had uh, COP26 going on, we have meeting on biodiversity, and we had the UN Food System Summit. So let me move a little bit to what do we have new in our strategic framework at FAO. So the new strategic framework that just got approved, it's very much aligned with the UN Food System Summit. And, and it's really very positive for us to see that the UN Food System Summit came with ideas that we have actually uh, were the pillars of our strategic framework that got approved in, in, uh, in uh, last summer, actually in July. So our strategic framework puts at its center the vision of leaving no one behind. And we think we can do so through transforming our agri-food system to become more efficient, to become more inclusive, to become more resilient, and to become more sustainable. And we do so through what we call the four batters. So our aspiration is really to make our production better, to make our nutrition better, to make our environment better. And hopefully we think with a better production, better nutrition and a better environment, people will have a better life. So the strategic framework, as I said earlier, focuses mostly on SDG one, uh, which is and poverty, SDG 2, zero hunger, but also on SDG 10, which is reduction of inequality, taking in consideration that we know we have many other SDGs that we are custodian of and that we are really, we need to, to uh, for sure deliver on. Uh, and within that, I mean, if you look at our strategic framework, harnessing science, technology, and innovation, it's very key when we talk about transformation. So I don't need to really to preach to this audience that for any of the better, you need science and innovation. 
And you need to scale it up, not only having the solution. I think we might be better at providing the solution, but we are not so good at scaling it up. And that's really one of the things we need to learn from the private sector, who in all reality is the best body that was that is able to take a, an idea from an idea to a product and scale up that product. So for all these four betters, we need science. And that's really what we are doing right now. It's really looking at where we need to build more capacity and more particularly more partnership really to connect with the knowledge generator, but also connect with the developing, the developing agencies to make sure that we get to scale. So within FAO, we are, we are not producing science. And that's a very important point as we talk to our partners, particularly to universities like today. So FAO uh, translates science and innovation into tools for development. We have a little bit of, uh, uh, let's see, we are producing data. We are producing uh, science, but only through our joint center with the International Atomic Energy Agency that is in, in Vienna. We have two centers together. We call them the joint center. And we are generating, uh, let's see, science and innovation. But really, the majority of it is that we are generating innovation or we are developing the science and innovation to tools for development. And this serves all our roles, be it knowledge sharing, because if you look at our basic text, we have four main roles as an agency to share the knowledge with the member state, the 194 countries that are members of FAO, give them support to, to put in place the right policies and the right policy frameworks, capacity building, and the fifth one, it's technical assistance. One of the roles that I see myself more for, for my office, it's really uh, speaking up, basically. It's speaking up for science. Because uh, in many ways, when you have a controversial science that is really creating a lot of pros and cons, uh, in certain, in certain subjects, FAO stayed silent. And I think really, as the new chief scientist in FAO, I need to, to be much more open, and I need really to make a statement for certain technologies. And the idea is that when you have a technology that is controversial, you find you create, and you don't talk and you don't say anything about it, you create a vacuum. And the vacuum, really, it's a good place for misinformation to take on. And, and really, we saw that with COVID-19. So we saw how social media really get us an infodemic. So the idea is really that as a, an independent body, that is not part of any of those new technologies, but sees the potential of those technologies, we could bring in science, we could bring in evidence, we could develop papers and develop statements and share information with countries. Um, so some of the technologies that really requires attention and that requires really that we speak up and we clarify the polemic around and we clarify uh, what's happening, it's genetic modification, whole genome sequencing, gene editing, synthetic biology, but also some of other low technologies that maybe we can use much more. So what we are doing right now, is writing a paper, we're showing a paper on genome editing application. And the idea really, we created a task force that looks at all emerging technologies, but this paper will be on gene editing with an idea that we develop a series of papers to address controversial, controversial technologies. So the other thing that we are really uh, pushing very hard to have as the first outlook in 2022, it's what we call science and technology innovation outlook. And the idea is really that we need to monitor agri-food technologies and innovation um, because FAO role, it's really help countries to identify to pilot and scale up technologies and innovation that are better for their ecosystem that is very much context specific, of course. And within that really, what we are looking for is gather data so that we praise the countries that were able to adopt certain innovation, that we understand better what's hindering others from doing it, to understand better 
how some countries did very well and adopt technology. So this we're going to become an annual outlook on science, technology, and innovation in the uptake of technology and innovation. And we are looking both at the policy side. So what policies makes that uptake of innovation and technology possible, but also what engagement of private sector, what engagement of actors, and so on and so forth. So I think knowing the status of the existing STA, STI at the national regional level will assess if they all and its member to understand better the global situation and hopefully trigger more South-South collaboration. I think we have a very good information of what's happening in OECD countries, but we have no idea what's happening in terms of science, technology, and innovation and uptake in the developing world. And that's what we are trying to really unreveal and, and bring, uh, bring to the attention of, of the member states. The other area that we are engaging on, it's really foresight and forward-looking uh, forward role uh, for the organization. So we are engaging in a strategic participatory foresight with regard particularly to emerging technologies and innovation to better prepare for alternative possible future and feeding into an anticipatory action as well as in convening the global communities including CGR, ERCA centers, private sector, civil society, farmer organization, indigenous people and others for constructive dialogue and exchange of knowledge. So the idea here really is that we should know about the technology long before it comes to the, to the market. Because if we know about it, we could make the policy, the regulation, prepare the market, prepare the scale up. I felt really it's a waste of time, it's a waste of resources, it's a waste of efforts to really start a debate once the technology is the market. Because we are losing very important time to really end hunger, very important time to reduce poverty, very important time to increase nutrition, to do better for the environment. So we need to have a really a better idea of what's coming on the market, get ready for it. So once the technology is ready, we use it at its fullest. So within that, we are undertaking a study to look at what are the breakthroughs in technologies and innovation that are expected in the next 10 to 30 years that can contribute toward achieving agri-food system transformation. What would be the context specific impact of these disruptive technologies or innovation? How can foresight enable the identification of synergies and trades off? And what is the role of foresight in informing policymakers to better anticipate investment needs and guide in future policies, particularly for emerging technologies and innovation? We're going to have our first workshop, uh, foresight workshop in December, and the second one in January or February. So all of this will be part and parcel of our FAO science and innovation strategy. So as I told you, we have our strategic framework that's very ambitious for 10 years. And within that, really to make sure that we are able to put in place, in place our strategic framework, we are developing a science and innovation strategy to strengthen the use of science and innovation in FAO, technical, technical intervention, sorry, but also normative guidance, and to serve as a key tool for the implementation of the strategic framework. The strategic framework puts science, innovation, data, and complement as accelerators. Uh, and those accelerators are ways and means to get us really to a higher impact in a shorter time. So within that really for all these four uh, accelerator, as I said, technology, innovation, data, and complement, really we see a huge role for science and technology and innovation to really do far better. So with that, I wanna leave you with four main uh, key messages. I think really 2021, it's a, a golden opportunity for us to really design a new agri-food system that works better, and particularly to link it to mega agendas. Climate change agenda, I think really since IPCC was put in place in 1988, and particularly with the, the Global Development Agenda Agreement uh, around really stopping the, 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 the temperature rise at 1.5 uh, degree 
uh, scenario, uh, climate change has attracted a lot of attention. So we had a lot of funds that were created around it. We are not doing very, bad, very well in terms of implementation, but in terms of engagement, in terms of science, in terms of financing, climate change got the attention it deserved. In the implementation, it's another story, but at least it has the attention of all actors. The other area, and we have COP26 that just started a few days ago on Monday. We have also biodiversity agenda, which is very big. And as I said, we have a body of information and science that's taking place again, the CBD 15 this year and continuing next year. So I think it's a golden opportunity for us to, to put the dots together. These three mega agendas are not separate from each other. Climate change is impacting agriculture. Agriculture is impacting uh, uh, climate change, biodiversity. So those agendas should not be in silos, but she, they need really to be put together so that we find an agri-food system that will allow us to feed the population, particularly the growing population, but without with minimizing the damage to the environment. The second point I want to leave you with, it's really leveraging science, technology, and innovation for sustainable and resilient agri-food system should be guided by an assessment of risk, inequalities, synergies, and trades off. So there is nothing, no action that we can take that does not impact the remaining of the food system or even the remaining of the species. As we said, we are 8.7 million species, human being, it's one of them. And in all reality, we are damaging the planet and we are not even fair to each other. So there's a huge inequalities between us, but there is also huge damage toward the other species that as the only species that can speak, or maybe the others speak, but at least we can think, we can plan, we should protect what we have on, on, on this cosmos. And we need to really make sure that we develop the right agri-food system. And that's where science, it's very important to really to assess, but also to find us the solution and to give particularly policymakers all the information so that they take the right decision. The third point, in my mind, it's really the need for diversification. So diversification, it's very important when you talk about the agri-food system. And the diversification could occur at all levels. It can occur at the global level, regional or local. It could occur in any part of the, the agri-food system, um, be it the production, be it the processing, be it the market, be it the trading. It could be ecological diversification. It could be diversification at the household level. It's very fundamental if we have to develop a resilient system. So there was a very interesting paper that, uh, that we developed as scientific committee, again, of the UN food system at the resilience. Uh, how could we make sure that our agri-food system is resilient? And the bottom line of it, it's really diversification. And I always say it's like if when you get your first job and you get a bit, uh, some, some money on the side, you go to a bank and they say, if you want to invest it, you better diversify your portfolio. It's the same thing in the agri-food system. We need really to embed in ourselves the need to create diversification at all levels. Uh, the fourth point, it's really the science policy and practice and people interface and society interface that needs to be strengthened and streamlined to boost the impact. And here really, there is, uh, there is only nine years, as I, get, as I said earlier, that really are left for 2030 uh, to fulfill our global development agenda and our promises. And there is no, no really time to lose. Uh, we need to act quickly. And in that acting quickly, I see myself that there is a lot of innovation that could be scaled up right now in many countries, but the framework for it, it's not there. And that's where many, are, I know that we need more, we need to do more research. We need to build more innovative ways of, of producing food, of processing food, of using food or feed or fiber. But also we need more international development to scale up those technologies that exist right now in many parts of the world, but particularly the developed world that needs also to make it to the South. And that's where science and policy is very important, not only for the new controversial science, but also for the science that 
we might think it's a, it's a granted, but when you go to a developing world, you see that most of the farmers are still working with old seeds, not improved seeds that have no access to irrigation, no access to fertilizers, no access to mechanization, and so on and so forth, storage, you name it. So the science policy, it's a, it's a low hanging fruit that seems much easier to do very quickly, and I hope we will be able to do it. With that, I'm very uh, happy that I'm with you. Thank you for your attention, and I will be ha very happy to take questions. Over to you, Dr. Place. Okay. All right. Uh, I think <clears throat> so. Thank you very much, Dr. Luffy. Uh, that was a excellent uh, presentation, very thought provoking, and really got me thinking uh, a lot about various kind of things we need to keep in mind about uh, feeding the hungry and strengthening our food system, better utilization of science in regards to, to what we do. So we want to move now into the Q&A portion of, of our lecture. And um, I wanna remind the audience about using the Q&A function. We already have some questions coming in and uh, so keep them coming. And at this time, I'm glad to introduce Dr. Dave Housington, um, Hoisington, I'm sorry, uh, who will be moderating the Q&A portion of our time together. Uh, so Dr. Hoisington is a director of our USAID Feed the Future Innovation Lab, and is part of our US government's uh, strategy to fight hunger and poverty around the world. And we host it here in our College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences. And I, I have come to find out that as a student, Dr. Oluthi uh, worked in, in Dr. Hoisington's lab in Simmons. And that's why we asked Dave to be here to facilitate the Q&A piece. So Dave, I'll turn this over to you uh, to facilitate the, the Q&A uh, time that we've had. Uh, thanks, Dean Place. And, and it's really great to see you again, Yismahan. I, I won't try to be as hard on you as I probably was when you were a student in the lab at Simmons. Uh, but but I must say that it's it's really gratifying to to see a student to you know you cross paths with uh, earlier in their career, you know and achieve so much and and be a leader uh, in today's world and and I especially appreciate the the, the focus on science and, and research that you're bringing to FAO, having one that worked in in basically your entire career in in international agricultural research, it's really great to see that renewed interest by FAO in, in science. Um, as, as, as Dean Play said, we already have a, a number of, of questions, so I'll try to get through as many as we can in the, in the time remaining, but I wanna start off with one from Alexa Lamb, uh, who really loves the fact that science communication is, is you know, really at the forefront of, of the thinking at FAO now. And I think we all know that that's so critical to, to get the agenda achieved. But she wants to kind of know what, what's the role that you see of universities like UGA playing with FAO and how can we help? What's the best way that we can support those communication efforts that you outlined at FAO? Thank you very much, Dave. And it's really a pleasure to be with you. Uh, and, and that's nice that we lose track of each other and then meet again in a different setting. So science communication, it's very important. I think really, uh, particularly with the, with the social media right now, I mean, uh, we saw it with COVID-19, it's unbelievable. People that have no idea what science is are speaking, making videos, and then it goes viral. So I think our role, and particularly academia, the role is really to speak up. I mean, we are, as scientists, very much used to peer review publications. And it is very important. It's very solid. It's peer reviewed and that's why it's very solid and very trustworthy and very accurate and very strong in terms of, of analysis and, 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 uh, and, uh, and the whole thinking behind it. But we have also to do more on the other non-scientific communication. I think it's, it's the role of academia to also speak up. In my side as FAO, uh, we have to speak up because we are the UN Organization for Food and Agriculture, and we deal with 194 members, and they're looking up to us to tell them if it's good or no, or what are the risks and what are the strategies. But really, for a university, you are the, the science, the knowledge generators, and you know it's better than anybody. 
you are the most specialized in this virus or that bacteria or that pathway or that processes. So you are the best to, to really explain it out there. So as we are doing the peer review publication, we need to do more in the other science communication so that the public understand it, so that the public use it, but also we need to explain it more to the private sector, for example, to attract maybe their attention to certain area and get them to invest more in it. Policymakers, it's very important as well, so that they have all the tools. Uh, most of, uh, we need to look at other ways and means to do it as well. It's uh, the science communication has to take different shapes uh, because it is done to different, uh, to different receivers and different people that need it. And, and one does not mean you don't do the other. So if you do peer review, it doesn't mean you want to do a TikTok on the subject, for example. Or if you do uh, 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 awareness program for the public, doesn't mean you will stop your peer review or if you do policymakers. So I think there is a huge role for academia because again, you are the knowledge generator. You are the most specialized in that publication and that subject in, that you publish. So take that peer review and maybe convert it into other communication tools. And that's what I'm trying to do at FAO. I'm trying to put in place a, a platform where I have networks of networks that could be around sectors, around discipline, around the regions. And the idea is really to bring those scientists to communicate more. So we can do some of it as FAO, but I'm looking really at this networks and networks of networks to do much communication. So if we have the right scientist that speaks about technology or an innovation or an invention, nobody can really go and take that space because you have already the person that knows it the best speaking out about it and giving out information. So you won't have any more that miss information and the flood of misinformation that we lived through in COVID-19 and in other subjects, not only in COVID-19. We got it in many, many other subjects across the years. Over Very to good. you. Yeah, I think we, we all know the importance of communication and there's so many different audiences and so many different ways to communicate that it, it is a challenge, but it's very critical to do it. Uh, the, the second question is kind of regarding the idea that, yes, we know that there are some really big challenges that are occurring and, and we need to address them to, to really achieve you know, food security in the future. A lot of these are long term, but we know in many countries, for example, Madagascar, there's tremendous challenges right today due to climate change. And how does FAO and, and you balance that, that difference between the long term goals that we need to achieve, but really some of the short term challenges that we're facing? Mm. Dave, could you repeat it? I, I think I missed you for a few seconds. It, the, the question is, is how does FAO balance that long-term strategy to try to solve problems that, that will take several years to, to reach, but with some of the short-term challenges that some countries and some regions of the world are facing today? I mean, Sea levels are rising. Climate is definitely changing. Even here in the U.S., we're seeing droughts that that weren't achieved, you know, just last year. And and so, how do you balance that short-term need and 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 demand versus the longer term? So, Dave, uh, see, when we talk about the SDGs and the Global Development Agenda, we have a really long-term uh, plan. But the reality, as you said, there are a lot of challenges, particularly in terms of conflict. And that conflict could be from human, it could be from climate change impact or other reasons behind the conflict. And in those conflicts, we have what we call what we call the OER, which is uh, the, the emergency group um, who worked very closely with the Wood Food Program. So most of our programs are really long-term programs. So most of our work with government, particularly it's putting in place the strategies, it's implementing the strategies, changing it. So it's all long-term and they are very much connected to the NCD NDCs that the countries have in terms of international reporting for poverty, malnutrition, and what have you, and, and uh, carbon emission and what have you. But really, we have to deal with those short-term, and that's where there is a specific division. 
that really deals with it and that really makes sure that we are one of the first people to go to Yemen when there is a problem. We are the first of the people to go to Haiti when you have a cyclone or something. So, so there is a really, it's not an easy, particularly in terms of financing, it's not easy really to, to, uh, to keep particularly the long term when you have to deal with the short term. And in terms of financing, we are finding a lot of difficulties to say even in conflict areas. When we go in conflict areas, because of whatever it is, we need to have a development plan because the conflict will, will subsidize slightly, will go away, but then the people have to have already a strategy that there is an exit strategy right after the conflict. So it's, it's, a, it's this nexus between the humanitarian and development. It's a, it's a contentious one, and it is particularly contentious in terms of finance. Uh, most of the developing or most of the, the agencies are much more um, open to provide funding for, for humanitarian, but not less so for development. Whereas really in terms of return on investment, when you look at it, if you do a development program, even in a conflict zone, it's far better and it's much more surviving and much more better for the population than just a humanitarian. So it's like uh, giving a fish or teaching somebody to fish. It's kind of uh, this, uh, this, uh, this dichotomy between the two. And we are trying really through our work with WFP and through our work on the emergency programs, to make sure that the, in the emergency program, we embedded developments, developments that have much more long-term uh, targets and, uh, and objectives. Good. Um, we've had a couple of questions that I'm gonna to try to combine for you into one question. And, and it, it, it's around the, the subject that, you know, I think we all understand the important role that technology plays in, in so providing the solutions to, to many of these problems and crises. But we also know that technologies, A, are very expensive sometimes. And so how do we make sure that those technologies can really reach a lot of the poor of the world that are the ones that are the most malnourished and probably need those solutions the most? But also we know that oftentimes that technology is tied up in the hands of the private sector. And you mentioned the role that the private sector needs to play in deploying that solutions to, to the world. and so. How is, how is FAO dealing with that? And, and is FAO concerned or, or do you have strategies and how you're going to get the private companies and the cost of these solutions down to really have the most impact? So absolutely true. Unfortunately, that's where I mentioned that there are a lot of innovation that are scaled up in, in the OECD countries and developed world, but not in the developing world. And we look at it David, it's, it's really the cost. The cost, most of them are very, very costly when it goes in the south. I always give an example of how, when I was doing my PhD with Simit and Icarda, I used to buy the enzyme when I am in the lab in, in, in Icarda in Syria, the box of TAC enzyme for $3,000. When I'm in Spain, in Cordoba University, I used to buy the same for 300 euro, $300. And when I went to Cornell University, I find out there is an agreement between Cornell and the company and they produce their own tech. So that's an example for you, how innovation, it's not the same cost for everybody. When you look at fertilizer, when you look at mechanization, those that need this the most have to pay the most for it. But need, so that doesn't make much of a sense sincerely. And that's where we need really to bring innovation to be more affordable at the small holder level to the poorest of the poorest farmers in the South. And to do that, the only way to do it, because when you talk to companies, they would say we manufacture it in this place and then there is transportation and there is this and that and infrastructure. It's, it makes sense, it gets more expensive. So what we need to do, it's really make sure that we develop the local private sector and that local private sector could be with the, with the multinational, but it has to be local. Manufacturing has to happen local. Certain things have to be local so that they are affordable. And that's where IP issues are very important. And you know it better than me, Dave. You worked in the CGR centers 
for years and you dealt a lot with the private sector. How could we have a differentiated uh, treatment toward developing world? How could we have an IP that recognize that it needs to be maybe for free for certain communities or certain region? So this is a really a long discussion, but I see really the, the solution, it's in developing the local private sector. If we develop the local private sector, the costs will come down and hopefully also you could create a, a, a dynamic, particularly with the youth now. Most of Africa, for example, we have very young people that are completely away from agriculture. To bring them back, we can bring them back with the potential that it could be a private sector, that it's going to include innovation, that has a potential for growth. Um, and IP issues are, are a huge problem that we are trying to deal with, uh, particularly now as we are looking to open up more to work with the private sector, recognizing the appetite and the willingness we are seeing from private sector for international development. Good. I think we've got lots of great questions, but I, I understand we probably only have time for one more. So I'm, I'm going to kind of ask you one to, to give you our, your impression of just how committed do you think the countries and the governments around the world that you work with are to this really ambitious agenda that you have? I mean, are the rich countries ready to step up? Time is short, challenges are huge. You know, are you optimistic? Is FAO really optimistic that, that this is achievable and, and we are going to actually make an impact? I think, yes, it is achievable, but I think we need to act very quickly. I don't think the issue is finance issue. Uh, when you look at the numbers, uh, particularly when you include the private sector, the numbers are huge. Uh, and, uh, and there is trillions and trillions of dollars. It's how to connect the need to the person that has and can give. And I think really that, uh, that goes back to reducing inequalities, communicating better, and also maybe really thinking out of the box. Maybe we need really certain dramatic changes uh, in, our, in our system, uh, including how could you bring a private sector uh, to, to do, instead of all these foundation, to really work directly with local SMEs and, and maybe uh, uh, give them an opportunity, nurture them and, and, and teach them how to make, it, make business out of it. And also myself, I think really, Dave, that uh, we're not looking at uh, armament and defense budget. So even very poor countries put so much money in defense and maybe a deal with all the armament companies and countries that they put a percentage in international development, a percentage in the agri-food system, we might be completely, we don't need much resource mobilization anymore because 1% of the armament budget will give us plenty to reverse, not reverse biodiversity loss or climate change, but at least to stay within the 1.5 scenario and to produce enough for everybody. So there is a multiple, multiple areas. It's possible if the will is there and if we come to an agreement that we are interconnected, we are in this boat together and we need save because ever we save all of that or we all go to, to extinction. Very good. Yes, we, we must remain optimistic. And so thank you very much for, for the discussion and for your presentation. And, and I hope that we, we have the opportunity to meet in person in not, not, not too distant future rather than just virtually. So back Looking to you, Dean Place. I hope so as well. Thank right. you very much for hosting me today. Yeah, so thanks. And uh, Dave, thanks so much for facilitating the Q&A portion here of our lecture. And uh, I must say, Dr. Luffy, that, will have, that has been the, the greatest um, um, like hour and 15 minutes, um, and I really appreciate what you had to say. It was very innovative, uh, thought-provoking. We got lots of uh, very positive comments that have come in from people who have uh, tuned in to, to watch this. I'm very intrigued by the one of the last things you brought up, uh, that wouldn't it be great if we could just take a portion of what we invest in defense um, and invest that in agriculture research and innovation and science. And boy, that would uh, truly be transformational for sure. 
And if there's something that we can do to move in that direction, um, wouldn't the world be a great place to be? And so I appreciate your thought about that. Um, but so thanks again for taking the time to be with us and to join us from uh, Rome. And um, again, it was, uh, I want to extend my appreciation to the committee um, that identified our speaker and reached out to Dr. Lupi uh, to be here with us for the D.W. Brooks lecture uh, today. And we do this lecture um, as a way to kind of gather as a college family and and really hone in on something that is uh, thought provoking and something that we all are working on uh, intently across the college. And you have uh, certainly um, hit the mark today, Dr. Luthi. So we do appreciate that. Um, so in closing, um, I want to thank you all for being on. I also, again, want to congratulate all the D.W. Brooks Award winners um, that, um, that I called out before. Thank you for your contributions and your leadership and uh, congratulations on those awards. And uh, lastly, uh, Dr. Luffy, thank you for being on and for what you, uh, what you shared. Uh, I do wanna let people know that we are recording this and we will be uh, making that available. So for, if you wanna go back and hear something uh, that she had mentioned, you all have a chance to do that. So again, thank you all for being on. Enjoy the rest of your day. And a uh, great evening to you, Dr. Luffy. I'm out in uh, Rome, Italy. Thank you so much, Dr. Place. Thank you, Dean. And a pleasure to be with you tonight. Thank you. All right, everyone. And I, I couldn't have a drink after that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.